Good morning or good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. This is day two of the Theological Conference. As you can see there, the time has struck zero. So we go this weekend. Today is April 9th, Saturday. And here's the schedule if you'd like to see what today's events, how they will unfold. Go to theologicalconference.org. And this event is uh, held by Restoration Fellowship, the name of our ministry. And you can find us at focusonthekingdom.org, as you see there. Founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. <clears throat> and uh, we have many other websites. Just go to the links. We have a magazine published monthly. We also have a podcast where Anthony reads his books and booklets that he's written through the decades now. And the conference is a forum for truth seekers and a gathering of truth finders. It's been held for more than 30 years now, this uh, event. So welcome to everyone out there. We have a free book uh, giveaway tonight at 7 p.m. So if you could please email me at the latest 6 p.m. tonight, and these are Eastern Standard Times. Uh, so if you'd like to be part of this uh, free book giveaway, depending how many people we get, So we'll draw the books there accordingly. So get your name through to us at, as you see there, Carlos, at thehumanjesus.org to be part of the free book giveaway. All right, so let me open with prayer before we start with uh, this morning's first presenter, Tracy Z. So let us pray uh, this morning. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time, for the technology and the opportunity to continue to teach about these important matters, about the gospel of the kingdom and the things regarding your human son, the Messiah. We pray for those less fortunate than us, for the continuing conflicts around the world, especially Russia, Ukraine. And we pray for all the brothers and sisters, the churches everywhere, like-minded, uh, anyone who might be going through any health issues, medical issues, you know all things, Father. So we thank you for, once again, this opportunity, and we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, so let's see. Let me introduce our first presenter this morning and if you go back to the theologicalconference.org go to presenters and there are the 2022 presenters we had uh pastor dan gill open proceedings last night if you'd like to see the videos by the way of these live sessions they are automatically uploaded and saved on our youtube channel and that's Focus on the Kingdom, as you see there, YouTube channel. So please look for that. All right, this morning we start with uh, Tracy, followed by Joe Martin. So as you can see, there's a short bio and uh, what our presenters are going to present. Tracy is a career missionary who served in Russia for nearly 20 years. She continues to serve in missions and alongside many scattered brethren and helps to encourage and strengthen the saints. Her website, kogmissions.com, engages in internet evangelism and connects like-minded believers around the world. And as you can see at the bottom, there's the KOG Missions, and that is the website. This is the ministry Tracy is part of, with a lot of material there for you to see. So Tracy this morning will present on 
the title here, the court will convene. If you look at the passage in Daniel 7, specifically verses 26 to 28, we often neglect the reality of God's coming kingdom. One day the court will convene and the kingdoms, countries of this world will be judged and become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the saints. Jesus will receive all authority and God's rule will be over all the earth. This earthly kingdom will never be destroyed. 1,000 years later, it will be handed over to the Father so that God may be all in all and there will be no more pain, suffering, or death. So good morning, Tracy. Hi, Carlos. Thank you for joining us and your work this morning. So I'll leave it up to you. Thank well, you. Thank you, Carlos. It's good to be here again. And the theological conference is always something I look forward to. It was a blessing being in person when we were able to do that. Um, but as we, you know, we know, it's a blessing also to be on the internet, which uh, brings a lot more people to the conference. And um, I'm yeah. sorry, Tracy. Uh, I forgot to tell our audience, if you have any questions after Tracy's presentation, uh, please feel free to ask in the chat. Preferably type your questions in all caps so it'll make it easier for us to see. Sorry, Tracy, go ahead. That's okay. And as Carlos said, the title of my presentation today is The Court Will Convene. I was really excited when Carlos uh, asked me to speak on the coming kingdom on the earth. It's one of my favorite topics, and it has been ever since I was a young person. And this is just exciting, and I hope you will be as excited as I am about this wonderful teaching in scripture. So it's the court will convene. And as Carlos mentioned, it's from Daniel 7, 26 through 28. That's what I got my inspiration from as I prepared this. And uh, he already read the first part of it since that was my uh, intro there. But we will start now with the court will convene. Uh, we often neglect the reality of God's coming kingdom. One day the court will convene and the kingdoms and the countries of this world will be judged and become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the saints. Jesus will receive all authority and God's rule will be over all the earth. His earthly kingdom will never be destroyed. 1,000 years later, it will be handed over to the Father so that God may be all in all. And there will be no more pain or suffering or death. And go to the next slide here. Okay. Throughout scripture, we see that the promise, the reward, and our hope is God's kingdom on earth. In fact, God created the earth and created mankind to dwell on the earth. Mankind's destiny and the destiny that he originated for us and that destination has not changed since that time. Abraham was promised the land and he did not receive it. David was promised an heir on the throne forever. And Jesus told us the meek would inherit the earth. In fact, the Lord's prayer that many of us say every Sunday morning is clear. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is returning to the earth to crush the kingdoms of this world and establish his father's kingdom from Jerusalem over all the earth. God's will is not done on the earth as it is in heaven. It wasn't done when Jesus was here and it isn't done now. It will only be done when Jesus comes at the very end of this present evil age. Contrary to the popular Christian song that's out there about building his kingdom now, that's not what we're doing, nor should we be trying to do that. Our work is to proclaim God's kingdom and to enlist people who will be citizens of the kingdom when Jesus comes. In Hebrews 2, 7 through 9, it says that mankind was made a little lower than the angels, but God crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And in putting everything under them, God left nothing that is subject to them, that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything sub subject to them, but we do see Jesus who was made, a, made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. Jesus has been exalted and crowned with glory, and everything has been put under his feet. 
that is declared to be put under his feet, yet everything is not subjected to him at this time. Another passage says that he is still waiting in heaven for his enemies to become his footstool. In 1 Corinthians 15, we are told that he must put everything under his feet, including death which will only happen after the great white throne judgment. And then he will hand the kingdom over to the Father so that God will be over all. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were living under God's rule. Once they disobeyed and sinned, they took that rulership upon themselves and put the crown on their own heads. Then, as a chosen nation, Israel rejected God as their king and wanted to be like the rest of the world, having an earthly king. So today, all of mankind is ruled over by mortal, unrighteous, selfish, and hungry, uh, power-hungry leaders. As Messiah, or a Messiah, a human being like us, was prophesied back when God cursed Satan in the garden. He revealed more information about who this person would be over the years until God's chosen and anointed human Messiah was begotten and born. Daniel wrote that at the end of this age, a rock not cut by human hands would crush all the other governments and rule forever after. Jesus from Nazareth was and is that man, Messiah and rock that will crush every authority on the earth. Jesus is now immortal, and that makes it possible for him to sit on David's throne forever. But today the world is not subjected to Jesus, and there is no king on the throne in Jerusalem, only wicked governments, some worse than others, that are all ruling the nations. Perhaps soon the Antichrist will rise for them, from them and rule the world. But one day the court will convene and his ruling authority will be removed, destroyed and abolished forever. That is the Antichrist ruling authority will be abolished. He will be the last mortal king to rule the nations. Then the kingdom authority and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be delivered to the people of the holy ones of the most high. This is so simple. The saints, God's people will be getting all the nations turned over to them on the earth. God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. All authorities will serve him and obey him through his son and the saints. This is the conclusion of the matter. This is how the story ends, or actually really begins. Daniel 7.28 says that when Daniel heard all of this, his thoughts troubled him greatly and the color drained from his face. I wonder if Christians today take this prophecy as serious as Daniel did. Daniel 7, 21 through 22 explains that while Daniel was watching, a horn began to wage war against the holy ones and was defeating them until the Ancient of Days arrived and judgment was rendered in favor of the holy ones of the Most High. Then the time came for the holy ones to take possession of the kingdom. This is Hebrews 2 finally being fulfilled. At this time, everything, including the nations, will be subject to Jesus and the saints. The location does not change. The only change is who is ruling, not where anyone is ruling. So let's just take a minute here and look at the um, timeline here. And according to Daniel, there will be a seven-year treaty. And if we remember when Jesus was asked, when are you coming and what are the signs of the end of this age? Jesus referred to the abomination of desolation and said the one that Daniel talked about. So we know to go back to the book of Daniel and see what Daniel had to say. And he talked about a seven-year treaty. And then in the middle of that treaty is when Antichrist sets himself up as God in the temple, which is the abomination of desolation. And then here at the end, there will be resurrection and, and Armageddon. The Antichrist will rule for 42 months which is three and a half years, but he does have a court date. There is an end to that time. And final judgment has already been decreed, which is destruction in the lake of fire. And at that time, the holy ones will take possession of the kingdoms of the earth and establish one kingdom rule over the entire earth, over all the nations, 
God's kingdom rule through his agent, his anointed Messiah, Jesus, and the Holy Ones, will be the beginning of a new kingdom on this earth, a single universal kingdom, truly a new world order. Jesus's enemies will be made a footstool for his feet, and he will reign on his father's behalf. That should cause you goosebumps. It does me just as I'm reading this, and I'm looking forward to that, and I hope you are too. But before that happens, we'll see here this next timeline. Before that happens, the earth will be trampled and crushed. The holy ones of the Most High will be harassed continually, and they will be delivered into the hands of Antichrist for three and a half years. So on this timeline, we see that Antichrist will make his throne in God's temple, as we mentioned, the abomination of desolation is when that happens, when he does that. Then for the 42 months, there is going to be forced worship of the Antichrist and his image that the false prophet set up. All of humanity will be required to take his mark, which is referred to as 666 or the mark of the beast. And obviously we don't know quite what that's going to look like, but that's what it's referred to. And these believers during this time are going to be ha harassed continually. And with this mark of the beast, we are, it's an economic uh, problem for the earth, for those who don't take the mark. It's not just about taking a mark, because if you don't have it, you can't buy or sell, you can't pay your bills, you can't do anything. And so we will be harassed during that time. But not only in that way, the Antichrist is allowed to conquer and kill us as well, which it says those who do not worship his image and worship the beast will be killed, but we must remain steadfast and endure because we know that the court will convene. As it says, if anybody is meant for captivity into captivity, he will go. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, then by the sword, he must be killed. This requires steadfast endurance and faith from the saints. But be encouraged, the court will convene, this, way, this will end. And antichrists and all worldly governments, ruling authority will be removed, destroyed and abolished forever. And as Joe Martin says, hallelujah, amen. Then the kingdom, authority and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be delivered to the people of the holy ones of the most high. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. All authorities will serve and obey him. So again, this kingdom is on earth and Jesus with the saints will be ruling or governing under the whole heaven, not over the earth or in heaven or from heaven. The kingdom rule is world politics and economics reset for real and for eternity. Daniel saw all of this happening on the earth. Even John in Revelation, although he saw things in the spirit in heaven at times, like on a movie screen, he saw events that were pertaining to what would be happening on the earth in the future in regards to real people, real governments, and life here on the earth. Jesus said, the meek will inherit the earth, and we pray your kingdom come on earth. The prayer is that God's kingdom, that his rule that is now in heaven, would finally come to the earth as well. The prayer asks the Father that his government would be upon the earth, which means over all the nations that are on the earth. Unlike Israel, when they chose a king over Yahweh, the Christian prayer is for Yahweh to be the supreme ruler instead of the present ruling authorities who are greedy, violent, and power-hungry leaders. At no time does thy kingdom come all of a sudden become a kingdom above the earth or in heaven or prior to the return of Jesus the Messiah. Christians were not told to usher in this kingdom. They were told to herald it and to announce it, proclaim it, just like Jesus did. Our purpose and our goal for today cannot be to try to bring about this kingdom or make the governments of this world rule people and countries righteously, like only Jesus will do when he comes and he is king. 
Jesus is not ruling from heaven, nor is he enthroned as king yet on the earth. In fact, he is still waiting to come to the earth to put all of his enemies under his feet at that time. With that said, followers of Messiah can and should live and practice a kingdom lifestyle today. We are in training and we have been given a job to do as we see in the parable of the master going away for a while and having given his servants talents to use. And in English, we may confuse our thinking about talents. He was not talking about our skills or our abilities. He was talking about money in the parable. And I believe, though, Jesus' parable does encompass both and even more. The talents can be anything that we have been given. The bottom line, our lives and everything we have been blessed with, are what he has given us and what will be required to give an account for. We must invest what we have and our lives in productive kingdom activity for the master. It is a dangerous thing to bury or just sit on what we have been given. In Luke 4.43, Jesus told them that he must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns too, for that was what he was sent to do. Jesus was sent or commissioned by God to tell people about God's coming rule, his government on the earth, and what it would be like, and how one could have citizenship. And in fact, he told us to do the same thing. This kingdom was referred to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, but never a kingdom in heaven. Even the verse many like to argue where Jesus said that he goes to prepare a place for us does not say that that place remains in heaven. In fact, it is perhaps referring to the new Jerusalem that too, as Jesus does, comes down out of heaven to the earth. Jesus did not give us any details about this place. He was going to prepare for us. We do know from his constant teaching on the future kingdom, though, that it would be here on this earth. James and John asked about places prepared for believers in the coming kingdom in Mark 10, 40. But Jesus replied, to sit on my right or at my left is not mine to give. It is for those whom it has been prepared. Even in those places were even if those places were prepared in heaven, neither Jesus nor James and John even entertain the idea that those places would be somewhere other than the kingdom here on the earth. The main hope is that where Jesus will be, there we will be too. If to read the rest of scripture, we see that Jesus will be here on the earth. In Zechariah 14.4, it says that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. If preaching and teaching about the coming kingdom was what the Almighty God commissioned Jesus to do leading up to his ultimate sacrifice, ought we not lead with that same message and hope? This message of God's rule finally being administered over all the nations on the earth is the hope of those same nations. There will finally be a government that has its citizens in mind and one that truly rules righteously. When we understand the kingdom hope, we understand the nature of man and thus the nature of Jesus. It's all interconnected. When we understand who God's anointed Messiah is and see him as God's ruling agent, we can better understand who the Father is. And when we know the Father, the only true God, and Messiah Jesus, we are then able to love and worship them as they deserve. Jesus said that the most important commandment was to know, that is to understand and to believe that Yahweh is one God, not multiple ones rolled into one, or one consisting of multiple essences. He said that we should know and believe this, and then, unlike the demons, we should love Yahweh with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. Jesus also said that when we love him, this means we must obey him. Love and obedience go hand in hand. You cannot compromise one or the other. And there is a difference between knowing the command and obeying the commission. It says that even the demons understand. They know that Yahweh is only one God, and they shudder. 
But just knowing this fact obviously does not get you in the kingdom since you know that Gehenna has been prepared for Satan and his angels. Of course, people must hear and learn about who Jesus and the Father are. It's all a part of the puzzle. But that is not where Jesus started. The finished puzzle is God's kingdom with his appointed king ruling after the present world's ruling authorities are put under his feet. Only then, after the white throne judgment, will the anointed king hand the cleaned up kingdom over to the one who anointed him, the almighty God. The gospel, Jesus' message throughout his ministry, was the gospel of the kingdom of God. What it is who will be ruling, where it will be, which is on the earth, and when it will be, and that is when he returns at the end of this evil age. After one understands the kingdom, they should be compelled to know the true king of the kingdom. That is who he is. Those who choose to love him and follow him then, because of what they first saw in the proclamation of the future kingdom of God, will in turn then embrace the rest of what he shared and want to share this good news with others. So which puzzle piece or pieces would Jesus be willing to leave out? Most likely none. He taught about all of them and many more than are listed here. The kingdom picture would not be complete if any pieces were missing, big or small. Our job is to turn over all of the pieces and then put them together. And if we see someone has a missing piece or two, we should help them to find their missing pieces. In Revelation 5, 9 through 10, it says that Jesus was killed, and at the cost of his own blood, he purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. He has appointed them as a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Again, this kingdom of priests ruling the nations happens after the Great Tribulation and Armageddon, both of which happen on the earth. So why would all this be happening on the earth and then the reward be somewhere else or the kingdom that he talks about be somewhere else? It is important to understand the role of priests here. It is not about offering sacrifices up in a temple. In 2 Chronicles 17, 3 through 10, we can understand this a little bit better by looking at this. The priests were sent and taught throughout Judah, taking with them the scroll of the law of the Lord. They traveled to all the cities of Judah and taught the people. This was after the new king got rid of all idolatry and wicked practices. Jesus will conquer and destroy Antichrist, who had set himself up as God over all the earth. Idolatry and the abomination that caused desolation will be cut down and destroyed. At that time, the saints will rule with Jesus. And my guess, as his kingdom of priests, we will be sent to teach the mortals about the law of the Lord, perhaps governing one, five, or ten cities. In Daniel 12, 9 through 13, Daniel said that he heard, but he didn't understand. So he said, sir, what will happen after these things? Then the angel said, go, Daniel, for these matters are closed and sealed until the end, from, until the time of the end. But we do see more was revealed in these last days, the time of the end, since the time of Jesus' resurrection. He revealed a lot more information to John in the book of Revelation. So back here, Daniel was told that many will be purified, made clean, and refined, but the wicked will go on being wicked. None of the wicked will understand, though the wise will understand. Could you bring up the next set there, Carlos, please? Thank you. He then tells them that the time that the daily sacrifice is removed and the abomination that causes desolation is set in place, there are 1290 days. Blessed is the one who waits and attains to the 1335 days. But you, Daniel, should go on your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will arise, that is, be resurrected, to receive what you have been allotted, your inheritance. Daniel's hope was resurrection, and ours is as well. 
God's plan from creation was the hope of resurrection. People live on the earth, they die on the earth, and return to the earth. They are then resurrected from the earth and will either receive their reward or an, and inheritance, which is the earth and immortality on the earth, or they will be condemned and be destroyed and their memory forgotten. Daniel 12, 2, 42 through 45 tells us that the latter stages of the present worldly kingdom on the earth at this time of the end of this age will be partly strong and partly fragile as iron mixed with wet clay. So both, so people will be mixed with one or another without adhering to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. In the days of those last kings who are ruling here on the earth, the God of heaven will raise up an everlasting kingdom in place of the present one, which is on the earth, and it will replace the one that is on the earth. And that kingdom will not be destroyed, and it will be a kingdom that will not be left to another people. Not because it's in heaven or somewhere, but because it is God's kingdom for God's people here on the earth. It will break in pieces and bring about the demise of all these worldly kingdoms. But contrary to them, God's kingdom will stand forever. And in interpreting the king's dream, Daniel told him that he saw that a stone that was cut from a mountain, but not by human hands, it smashed the iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold into pieces. The great God made known to the king what will occur in the future here on the earth. The dream is certain and its interpretation is reliable. After the 1000 year reign, when the white throne judgment takes place, the dead who were not raised when Jesus returned are raised from their graves on the earth. They are not called back from heaven and it does not say that their soul was put back into them. They became living souls once again just like God created Adam from the dust of the earth, and they too will come to life in that way and they will be judged. Some will be granted immortality, like those received when Jesus returned, and others will be condemned to destruction. Revelation 20, 13, verses 11 through 13, if to look at that portion of scripture, says that the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each one was judged according to his deeds. It is clear that the dead, all who died, were in the sea or in their graves, and they came up out of the sea and out of their graves. They came up from the earth, not down from heaven. We even see a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to the earth at that time and that God himself will make his home with us, not us going to him. His tabernacle will be here and he will be tabernacling with us. That is, he will pitch his tent and he will dwell in unbroken communion with us. Colossians 3.24 tells us that we can receive a reward and an inheritance you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the eternal inheritance he has promised since he died to set them free from the violations committed under the first covenant. For where there is a will, the death of the one who made it must be proven for a will takes effect only at death since it carries no force while the one who made it is alive. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything was purified with blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So what is in a will is what will be inherited after someone's death. After Jesus died, the promised inheritance can now be received. Jesus will bring with him when he comes this reward. We do not receive it when we die. Just as he said, I am coming soon and my reward is with me. As a result of this promised inheritance, as we live each day waiting for the bridegroom, 
whatever we are doing, we should work at with enthusiasm as to the Lord and not for people, because we know that we will receive our inheritance from the Lord as a reward when we are resurrected and when Jesus returns. We ought to serve the Lord Christ because the one who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. And there is no exceptions. There are no exceptions. This is a blessing and a curse. There are blessings and curses as God told Israel. And he gave them the free will to choose what they would receive. He's just telling them there's a blessing and there's a curse. You get to choose what it is. And in this passage, we see that there will be a reward and punishment. And again, we all have a choice to make and we have the free will to choose what we will receive. We will receive one or the other and we get to choose which one it will be. Even those who choose to follow Jesus though and are waiting for him to return could end up falling away if they are like, the five of the 10 virgins in Jesus's parable. All 10 were waiting for the bridegroom. They believed and they were waiting, but only five were still prepared with oil and waiting when he finally did come. Those unprepared had the door shut in front of them and they missed out on the wedding. Similarly, the seed of the kingdom that people often receive with a sincere heart in the end withers and dies and gets choked out by the world or is stolen by Satan because they are not vigilant. Unfortunately, this not only happens in the lives of individual believers, but also in churches and ministries today. Jesus warned the churches in Revelation since some had become lukewarm and others had lost their first love. The kingdom seed of hope must be attended to daily if it is to grow rather than to shrivel up and die. A believer's reward or inheritance is resurrection and immortality here on the earth. Abraham was promised the earth, and we are heirs according to that promise. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have closed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor there is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is speaking of all who will choose to clothe themselves with Messiah and walk in obedience, not just a select few or 144,000. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he would later receive as an inheritance. And he went out without understanding where he was going. By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the promised land as though it were a foreign country, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Hebrews 11, 39 through 40 tells us that the list of faithful believers that Abraham was one of, all were commended for their faith, yet they did not receive what was promised. For God had provided something better for us so that they would be made perfect together with us on the earth, not in heaven. Abraham went to the grave holding on to the promise that God gave him and trusted that God would keep his word and that he would one day receive his inheritance. In Acts 2, 29 through 36, we see another covenant that promises that humans will reign on the earth. Although David both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today, he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on the throne. David, by foreseeing this, spoke about the resurrection of the Messiah and that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor his body experienced decay. This Jesus God raised up. We are all witness of it. So then, exalted to the right hand of God and having received the promise of Holy Spirit from the Father, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. David, too, went to the grave without having an eternal descendant on the throne. Yet he believed God and he knew that God would keep his word. We have the same hope that one day David's descendant, Jesus, will sit on his promised throne and rule the earth from the earth. John 5, 28 through 29 says, do not be amazed at this because a time is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. That is, come out of their graves. They will wake up, not come back from heaven. The one the ones who have done what is good to the resurrection resulting in life and the ones who have done what is evil to the resurrection resulting in condemnation. Resurrection is the key. If there is no resurrection, there is no life after death and you would just remain dead just as Jesus would have. And life after death, or better yet, maybe coming to life after being dead, only happens at Jesus's return, which is at the first resurrection or the resurrection of judgment, the white throne judgment. All humans who ever lived will come back to life at one of these two resurrections. John 5, 28 to 29 is similar to Daniel 12, 2. Many of those who sleep in the dusty ground will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. These two verses are the short version. They are an overview of what will happen, simply stating the fact that everyone will be resurrected. Some will receive life and others will be punished and destroyed forever. It does not give a time frame or insinuate that there is only one resurrection where all of this takes place at once. Revelation is clear about two resurrections, agreeing with the first resurrection that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24. Micah 4 talks about future days where people and nations go up to the mountain of Yahweh for instruction and judgment. Swords will be made into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not use weapons against other nations and they will no longer train for war. Life will be very different, but life will still be here on the earth. Each will sit under his own grapevine or under his own fig tree without any fear. It doesn't say each will get his own cloud. The Lord's heaven's armies have decreed this. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth and everything in them, has decreed that this earth will be renewed and restored and that human beings will live on it and rule over it, just as he intended from the beginning. Humanity's hope is to inherit the world, this earth. The promise was to Abraham and to his descendants and believers are his descendants through Jesus. This promise to inherit the world will not come through military strength or wealthy rulers. It will be fulfilled when the righteousness that comes by, it will be fulfilled through the righteousness that comes by faith. The governments and leaders of the world have refused to hear and obey the one who gave them their authority, the one who has allowed them to rule this planet for the time being. But be encouraged and know that the court will convene. The world's ruling authority will be removed, destroyed, and abolished forever. At that time, the kingdom, authority, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be delivered to the people of the holy ones of the Most High, and God's kingdom will be an eternal kingdom. All authorities will serve him and obey him through his Son and the saints, and this is the conclusion of the matter. Thank you, Carlos. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Very, very well done, as usual. Uh, great slides. Uh, people are commenting about your slides too. Thank you for your great uh, work there. Uh, we have a few questions here, or a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Michelle asks, can you further explain the treaty of seven years that is on the timeline? Well, I can only share what we know from the book of Daniel, and it tells us that the king of the north there will... 
uh, the Syrian, as we know in other places, will make a treaty with Israel for seven years, as Daniel was told. And then at the in the middle, that is when the, the abomination of desolation will take place. It really doesn't tell us any much more about the treaty. Um, in my own mind, I think of it as probably a lot of uh, things going on in the world as they are today between Israel and the rest of the world. And so uh, I'm assuming, even though it doesn't particularly say that this treaty will bring about peace, I presume, because it says in the middle it's broken. And most likely it will either allow uh, Israel or the Jews to either build their temple or if the temple has been built to start offering sacrifice there again. But there will be some sort of treaty, a peace treaty, I believe, um, but it doesn't really, I don't think, tell us a lot of details. And that's one thing, Carlos, that and everybody that we need to remember when we look at these prophetic things and we look at the end times as, you know, this timeline of events and revelation and all that and prophecy, we need to remember the words in Revelation at the end of the book where we are told, do not add to this prophecy in the book of Revelation or take away from it. And I think, you know, we can apply that to the rest of scripture, but it was specifically stated for that book of, you know, the prophecy in Revelation. And as I share with a lot of the ladies in my Bible studies and when I teach is we can only go by what is written in scripture. We can imagine or think or presume, you know, what makes sense when we look at different passages. But beyond that, we can only really take what is written. And there is a lot written that is uh, just a, a little bit. It doesn't give us a lot of details, kind of like the kingdom that continues after the white throne judgment. All we know is that little bit in Revelation 21 and 22 and that in another passage, it says that we cannot even imagine or think of or understand what God has prepared for those who love him. So we have to leave a lot of things on the table and say, you know, I don't have all the details for that. We need to study and understand what is given to us and what he does tell us so we can be prepared and not deceived. But we can't go beyond what is written. So thanks for the question, Michelle. All right. Here's another one. Um, let's see if we can decipher this. It's a bit, uh, let me see. Um, so I think this person is asking, uh, the first resurrection was spiritual and to be born again, uh, during our lifetimes, that's what first resurrection means. Uh, can you comment or answer? Sure, I'd love to. Thanks for watching. And thanks for the great question. Um, I don't believe the Bible teaches that the first resurrection is spiritual or being born again. Uh, I think when we look at the rest of the New Testament, we really see that born again experience or what that happens to be now during this time when we um, are born again, essentially in our belief of Jesus and accept this uh we, we walk in obedience and I believe repent and we're baptized and we are born again from what we were to what we are now and that we walk now in a newness of life that we're told. I don't think that means only when Jesus comes. Um, that means that, you know, now that we're born again. I think we are, I guess you could say born again. I've never seen it like that per se when i look at the first resurrection it talks about the dead coming to life and me be, being given immortality that will be immortal after that point because we know jesus he was resurrected it wasn't just a spiritual resurrection he was here they saw him and they talked with him and then he went up into the clouds they saw him go up and it says the same jesus will be coming back down and we know from matthew 24 that uh, when Jesus is coming visibly, it says like the lightning flashes. So we see lightning and lightning flashes. He's coming and he sends his angels out to gather his elect, to resurrect the righteous, those who have faith. So Abraham, David, any of us who may be dead at that time will be resurrected and meet Jesus in the air. And then we will return to the earth here with him because he has a lot to do once he returns as do we. 
So um, no, I would not say being born again is at the first resurrection. The first resurrection is literally dead people coming back to life, like real, real people that have died have come back to life now, not just some spiritual idea. And that's my understanding of scripture. Thanks for the question. Right, and just as a follow-up, so, so you don't believe uh, the saints, Christians, are reigning now in in any type of sense, not even in so, some kind of spiritual sense. I mean, We're the not only reigning. way you're reigning is over your own life and over your tongue. Um, other than that, I look out at the world and, you know, maybe where we're living here in the West, it doesn't look so bad. But I think if you're in, well, the Ukraine right now or or uh, North Korea or Haiti and all these other places, I don't think those people think they're reigning. They, they see somebody else reigning. And um, no, as I mentioned, that's not our job today to rule the earth and to reign right now and make all the governments good. And um, our job right now is just to proclaim the kingdom, Jesus said, because he's the king that's coming and he is going to be the only righteous and good ruler over this earth. And we will be ruling with him at that time. And we don't have that power per se to rule this earth now. Jesus isn't even here now ruling. So you don't, so you don't um, advise uh, to use a softer word. So you don't advise fellow Christians to seek um, uh, positions during this present age of um, authority you mean or government ruling positions like run for president or, or, or ruling over people in a sort of political or. Uh, military way is that wrong then my understanding uh with what paul said that you will love one and hate the other that you can only follow one master and i believe personally that we cannot give our allegiance to anybody other than to god and to jesus um if you give your allegiance to a government or a country you then you gave your word God is very adamant about us, what we say, and our giving our word to things. And uh, if you give your word to that, you have to obey him. You have to do what they tell you to do, even if it is contrary to what God says. And so you really can't then follow after one or the other. I know a lot of people disagree with that. I personally uh, would not do that or advise that from what I read in scripture. Um I, I see it very clear that the Bible says to focus on one or the other. And and to again, we're not we can't create the world that we want. It's just not gonna be, and it's gonna go from bad to worse. We may help for a little while here, but our focus needs to be on talking about the coming kingdom and sharing this coming kingdom and that hope because that is when the reality of what people want today will be here because anything we do today isn't going to bring about that that hope all right thank you um just one uh last one if you don't mind sure. <clears throat> um let's see what why is the 70th week uh so that's daniel 9 uh still in the future in your view why is that still not uh come and gone I just don't see from the things that says will happen during that time have happened yet. Um, I don't know if you're more specific about anything in that. Uh, so Sorry. what what type of things have not happened that are in that last week called the 70th? I would have to pull that up, Carlos. If you can, I could look at it then. I don't have that in my head for today. But okay. um, no yeah. Um, I just think when we look at Daniel and we look at the prophecy in the Old Testament, we like when we start our Bible study on the end times, we start with Matthew 24, because that's where Jesus was asked, when are these things going to happen? And what is the sign of your coming in the, you know, the kingdom? And he referred, the only sign he gave them was the abomination of desolation. And he said to go back to Daniel, basically, because he said, what's in Daniel? And when we look in Daniel 12, it tells us from the time when the abomination is set up, it is 1290 days. And when we read in Matthew 24, it says after the great tribulation, that that is when you will see the sign of man, uh, the sign of the son of man coming in the clouds. And he sends out his angels to resurrect the dead who are in faith. 
And so the abomination has not happened. According to, if you look at Thessalonians and Revelation, that has not happened yet. And when it does happen, there are 1290 days until the end. And so it's been a lot longer than if people who believe in the uh, historical aspect of it than 1290 days. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tracy. And that's the 70 weeks there. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the abomination, the treaty you mentioned, uh, an end of sin, basically of iniquity, uh, and many, many things, uh, uh, many other things. That's why this hasn't. Uh, one last one, if you don't mind, Tracy. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered that. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one last one. Uh, <laughs> if the millennium is a literal 1,000 years, does that mean that the kingdom will eventually end? No, I think that 1,000 years is just the first phase of the kingdom because we know that that first 1,000 years, there are people still living and dying. There are mortals that have come into this kingdom phase that were still living during the last years when uh, Antichrist was ruling and uh, that were not believers, but they were not killed during um, the wrath or during the tribulation. And so they're still alive. And those people are coming into this first phase of the kingdom because we know in Isaiah it talks about uh, if people only live to be 100 years, that they'll be, that will be considered a curse. Well, we know in the eternal kingdom, after the white throne judgment, nobody's going to die. And so during this thousand years, there are people being born and dying throughout that time. And it's after that that everybody is raised who has not been made immortal when Jesus returned and resurrected, that they will then be judged. And those who are found written in the Lamb's Book of Life will then continue on into eternity, basically, in Revelation 21 and 22. We see that new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down. And that is only after, as we see in 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus has to put all of this authority that's on the world today under his feet. So it means ruling the nations, but it also says in 1 Corinthians 15 and in Revelation that death is the last thing to be destroyed. And we see after that white throne judgment, all the people who were not found written in the book of life were thrown into the lake of fire and death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. In essence, that means that's the end of death and dying in the grave. There will be no more graves. There will be no more death from that time forward. And from that time forward is basically eternity, which does not end. So that first 1,000 years will end because it's a specific time, the first part of that kingdom rule that is now on the earth. All right. Thank you, Tracy, very much once again for all your work. And um, okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, Tracy. All right, here's the website that this is the ministry Tracy is part of, kogmissions.com. Again, she's got many, many things here, materials, all, a lot of stuff. Um, as we said, Tracy is a mission worker, especially in Russia and many other places, and you can see and actually, Tracy will be back tomorrow for an update on her work and uh, perhaps talk to some uh, of the brethren there, uh, perhaps in those areas. So tune in tomorrow uh, and Tracy will be back for that. So, all right, next we will go to our next presentation. Uh, Dr. Joe Martin, <clears throat> as of January 2017, Joe's retired as president and executive director of the Church of God General Conference. Joe still teaches through Zoom distance learning at Atlanta Bible College. Joe and his wife, Rebecca, moved to Arizona to be near their family. He received his doctorate from Columbia Theological Seminary. One of his masters is from Fuller Theological Seminary. Joe recently published on Amazon a short book called Simply God, the divine name, the four letters, Yahweh, Jehovah, 6,828. Joe still teaches, practice, uh, preaches at different times. 
he and his wife have been to Africa to serve the churches there for about 25 years. Mission work is a great part of their lives. So today's title presentation is a pre-recording. Uh, so Joe uh, could not be with us live. So we thank him for taking the time to record this recording. I'll just put it on the screen as we go. The title is At Your Word, The Simplicity of Elijah, Jesus, and Us. If we could just simplify our words to be the words of the Father, Jesus, and the Bible, we may be better able to do Matthew 24, 14 and clarify theology and Christology. Examples from creation, Noah, Moses, the prophets, Jesus, Peter, Paul, and the book of Revelation will be reviewed in order to arrive at a few simple words that could be our keys to evangelism. So once again, uh, this is a pre-recording due to the time change, as we told you last night. Our event was postponed to this weekend, so apologies for that. But I hope you enjoy Joe Martin's presentation at your word. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Joe Martin. I'm in uh, Arizona. I've been thinking a lot about different mountains that brings on this subject. And the subject is going to be at your word. And it's based on 1 Kings 18, 35 and 36. And this is the account of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Rebecca and I had a great experience when we went to Israel in 1978, especially around uh, Jacob's well. You know, Mount Ebal and Gerizim are there. And this is where Joshua led the people up and half stood on Ebal to the north and then half stood on Mount Gerizim to the south. In the discussion of, you know, how close can we stay to the word of God? I, I just kind of want to go there this morning. And here's a picture of the sign at Jacob's well with that had Mount Ebal on the top and Mount Gerizim on the south. And remember that Mount Gerizim is the place where the Samaritans thought that Jesus, I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jesus and the Samaritan were talking, woman were talking. She says, we worship on this mountain. And this is a picture, a literal picture from 1978 on the top of Mount Gerizim. And it's a beautiful spot. It's kind of barren. Uh, this is in June, I think. So it's kind of dry. But you're looking towards Jordan on the east there. And it goes down to the Jordan River. And so it was just beautiful. And so to get up there, uh, we had to hire an Arab taxi. And this is a picture of Rebecca on the on Mount Gerizim in the Arab taxi. However, the only thing that was up there beside the sign saying the rock of Isaac's sacrifice, where the Samaritans think Isaac were potentially offered. Of course, the Jews say down in Jerusalem. The only thing up there was a gun emplacement with about 12 Israeli soldiers. And so they looked at us kind of crazy. And, and they said, basically, you foolish Americans, what are you doing here? This is occupied territory. <laughs> so anyway, they let us down, put us in a military vehicle with machine guns and soldiers in the back. Here's another favorite mountain. This is Mount Malanji. Malawi. In the front of this picture, you can see the tea plantations. Remember, Malawi and Kenya and many other countries were British colonies. One of the main things they grew in Malawi was the tea. I remember uh, Anthony telling the story when he first there, went there that he walked through these tea plantations for, for about 10 miles to get the little village where the church was. And so we had some great experiences there. So mountains are are fantastic. And this is a picture of the Melange View Motel looking up to the mountains. And we would have Bible studies there with the Malawian pastors and with the Mozambique pastors. As a break, we would often go on a game preserve. This is in a boat 
on the game preserve up north about 30 miles north of where we usually stay in Blantyre. And I don't know if you can see it, but in the back, this on this trip, we got to see about 10 or 12 elephants they were feeding. So right behind Rebecca and Anthony are the elephants that were feeding in the grass. So it, it was just kind of kind of cute. But the main thing was to study the word of God. They ha if you can see, there's like three little gazebos in there and you could fit about 15 pastors in there. And we'd all circle around and Jim Madison would talk for an hour and Anthony would go for an hour and Joe, I would go for an hour and we would just have discussions and just throw out any questions just to, to, to implant the word of God in their lives. And of course, we talked kingdom talk. We talked the one God talks, the Shema, and so on and so forth. But we spent beautiful many days there. Let's go to uh, this quick review of Mount Carmel. Remember, Mount Carmel is just to the south of Haifa. In fact, from Haifa, you can look out to the Mediterranean Sea, and it's just a fantastic view. By the way, just 15 or 20 miles to the southeast is Har Megiddo, Armageddon. And of course, the Jezreel Valley floats out and goes to the kind of south, northeast. And then you have Nazareth over there. So this is the plain of the great battle of the end of time. So Mount Carmel was a great battle for the one true God. First Kings 18, there were 18, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, uh, of Ahab and Jezebel, and they were to compete on two altars. And the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, you know, they put their bull on and started calling, trying to call to their gods, their idols, and they raved until the evening sacrifice and cut themselves with swords and lances as their custom was. But then... They went all day and then it got to the evening sacrifice, probably mid afternoon, three o'clock or so on and so forth. And Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord, Yahweh or Jehovah, however you want to say it. First Kings 1830. And he took 12 stones and built an altar in the Lord's name. He arranged the, wool, the wood and put the bull on it and laid it on it and dug a trench and poured water around it three times. And he prayed. Now, this was a. Uh, a major battle in confrontation with the prophets of Baal and Asher, these false gods. If you remember the story, Jezebel basically sent him a message and says, if you live a day, you're going to be lucky. So she started running and chasing Elijah. He went to the mountains to flee. And the Lord basically said, what are you doing here? I got business for you to do. Get on out of here. And so, but that was the great battle. And I'd like to focus on that because he says something in there that it's very intriguing to me. At the time of the evening sacrifice, now in Hebrew, you're reading it left, right to left. So at the sacrifice, Elijah the prophet stepped forward and prayed, O oh God, Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. And I did all these things and I've kind of circled it there so you can do it at your command, at your command or at your word. I've done all these things. And so to me, this is beautiful because in the middle of that word is the word debar. There are two prefixes, vav and bet, vabe, and then you have dbr. At your word, I have done all these things at your word. And so this is kind of the title of the talk. Can we do things at God's word? And of course, Elijah prayed. He watered the sacrifice three times and fire from heaven came down. But Elijah says, I've done all of this at the command of God, at the instructions, if you will, of God. And so uh, in in 1 Kings 18, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, all those instructions Elijah did at the command or at the word of God. And of course, with the fire falling from heaven on the very bottom line, finally the people said, and they said, Jehovah, Yodhe Vavhe, he is God. 
Yod Hey Vav Hey Yehovah. He is God. That's just a, a beautiful thing. And so when you think about the word of God, what are the first two actual words of God in the Bible? Uh, and this is Genesis, Genesis 1, and God created the heavens and the earth. And of course, there was darkness on the face of the deep. But the verse I want to look at is a little bit down on the lower left. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the very two first words that we have in our Bible from the mouth of God of the narrative of what's going on. Of course, creation narrative. Okay, we have Houston. We've got a problem. Are we listening to the word of God? Now, Adam and Eve are kind of the bad example to begin with. The Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. So look at that commanded. That's the same word. You know, God said, do this. And don't do that. And it was very clear. However, the serpent comes and tempts. Indeed, has God said? So putting a little doubt in their mind. Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said, well, God has said you shall not eat from it or even touch it or you will die. So the woman was repeating the words given to Adam very correctly and even adding, don't even get around that thing. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die. So today, too, we have battles in our society. Are we going to listen to God or be drawn into the culture of our present evil age? So we still have a battle on our hands. And we can look at examples of Noah and Abraham. God told Noah to build a ark. What was it? 450 feet long, 45 feet high, three levels. And so what would have happened if Moses had not follow, followed those direct instructions? Would the boat have capsized in the storms? I don't know. And then, of course, Abraham, the great Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 1 through 3. God said to Abraham, leave your father and mother. And Genesis 12, 4 may be the important part. So Abram left. So he followed. Eventually, Abrahamic faith is finally believing if God says it, he is going to do it. So mm, we look to Abraham for faith. Uh, he had problems. Noah had problems. But ultimately, we have to get back to the word of God. At your word, we do things. Okay, now look, this is kind of the, the bad example from Moses. Exodus 17, 6. I will stand before you there. This is God talking now. I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come forth. Well, Moses did that. He took his rod, and he struck the rock, and water came forth. However, God gave him different instructions, different words for the second time. And this is in Numbers 28. Take the rod. Assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. And so I did bolden the word speak there. He didn't say strike as he did whatever, how many years before. He said speak to the rock. However, what did Moses do? 20 verse 11. And Moses said... He's before the rock, before the congregation, waiting to get water. Must we fetch water? And he struck the rock twice. Yeah. Okay. Um, some people argue about baptism. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Should we obey this, the details? Well, if it's God's word, don't eat of that tree. Or if it's God's word, speak to the rock. <laughs> Maybe we should try to tune in to the, the clearer messages of God. So we're getting to Jesus now in the very famous uh, Deuteronomy 18, 18, verses 17 through 18 verse. God tells Moses, I'll, and I'll just read Remember, we're reading backwards here. 
I will raise up a prophet from among them, from their brothers. Okay, this should be a good example of Hebrews says he's one of us. He was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So God is going to appoint another prophet like Moses from the brothers. That means he's going to be born. Micah 5, 2, out of Bethlehem he comes. And I will put my words, and I, and I highlighted those in the pink highlighter. I will put the barre. The vare, I think uh, the modern pronunciation would be. God tells Moses, I'm going to raise this prophet and I will put my devar, my words in his mouth. And it goes on to say, and he will speak. And if someone doesn't listen, the bottom line, if someone doesn't listen to these words that he speaks in my name, I, this is God Almighty, will call them to account in the paper that you might access later on, I just go over that. God put his very words in Jesus's mouth. We accept this as Jesus because the New Testament talks about it. He has raised up a prophet. Jesus said, the words that I speak are not my own, but him who sent me. And this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. The, you know, the prophet, priest, and king of God appointed the servant of Yahweh. Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 53, 54, 52, 53. The suffering servant speaks the word of God. In Isaiah, it talks about the Lord has made my mouth a sharpened sword. It should remind us of Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we must commit to the words of God. Not like Adam, not like Moses in one situation. We must commit to the words of God. And the words that Jesus speak are the words of God. God says, I will call him to account. Now, in the paper, I go into that. You know, God is going to judge us based on Jesus' words. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So our words should reflect Jesus' words because Jesus' words reflect the Father's words. And this is out of Isaiah. I found something as I was playing with the Hebrew. And he says to this servant of Yahweh, the Evid Yahweh, it is too small a thing of you, the servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and the ones being kept of Israel to bring back Jacob and Israel I will also, this is the bottom line, make you a light to the Goyim, the Gentiles. Hallelujah, that's us. God is making this servant a light to us to bring my salvation, Yeshua T, to the ends Haaretz. I circled earth there, Haaretz. And so look at what, how do you spell salvation in Hebrew? Y-E-S-H-U-S-A-H. -S -S the H would normally be there, but it, since it's my salvation, this word occurs seven times exactly as it written. And of course, I wrote underneath that is Yeshua. This is the name, Luke 131, that the angel Gabriel gives to Mary. And so the God's salvation is manifested strictly in the person of Jesus, there's no, Hebrews, uh, I'm sorry, Acts, Acts 4.12. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Look at that. Yeshua's name, Jesus's name. Of course, I'm not going crazy on the Jewish roots, but we can use Yeshua because that is a name. Of course, it's the abbreviated Yehoshua, like Joshua, but salvation Jesus is God's salvation, so he's bringing his salvation to us through Jesus. Hallelujah. We need to listen to the words, the words of our God. Uh, so as we kind of work towards the New Testament, of course, in, in, the, in the paper, I, I told you that Jeremiah and Ezekiel are the ones who mainly have the Devar Yahweh. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of our and Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came. It's just almost, uh, I think it was 60 times for each of those. 
for each book. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. And say this and say that. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see an almond tree. You're, you're looking right. You're hearing right. And said the word of the Lord came to him. So we need to really consider that. But there was a transition, kind of where I'm going, between the Old Testament and the Hebrew. And it centered around the word logos. Okay, now the Greeks were using this word 500 years before Jesus was born. But my major reference for this, the theological dictionary of the New Testament, no matter how we construe it, as used by the Greeks, it stands in contrast to the word of the Old Testament and New Testament. Page 79, volume 4, uh, for Logos. Here's, here, here's where it really gets crazy in Greek mythology. They started personifying this word Logos, just as the uh, Proverbs does for wisdom. But this is a quote, Osiris is the half personified logos created by Isis. In all of their mythology, they're going this. Osiris is the half personified logos created by Isis. Hermes tells how by God's mercy, he became logos and hence Uyos Theo. This is page 86. Uyos Theo means son of God. So they were personifying the logos and making it weird and the last one is about philo the logos con logos concept plays a considerable role in philo and philo was born about 25 bc the logos theo is no longer god himself it is an ergon a work of god and look at this quote philo it is a god but of second rank before jesus began his ministry these crazy thoughts in greek mythology of course philo was a jew in greek mythology but he was in love with the philosophers totally messed up the notion of the ipsissima verba of almighty god the devar yahweh and god said well they are making this personification the creeds had made it Jesus God. That's not what it, the Logos was about. We could go into John 1, and that's been talked about ad infinitum, as they would say. Jesus is the walking, talking word of God, though. So we need to look at Jesus. Uh, we need to look at him in the terms of his prophecies from the Old Testament, especially Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, I will raise up a prophet like unto you, Moses, from the brothers, from a Jewish family, from the brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth. If you don't listen to them, God himself will call you to account. So it's uh, look at Jesus in this situation. What was he talking about? Well, the most beautiful one is Luke 4, 43, it is necessary for me to proclaim the good news, the good news, euangelion, the good message by Angelia is message. So the good message, the good word about the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. And of course, Jim Madison hammered this and Anthony hammers it. And we need to hammer it because this is the absissima verba. Come inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so this is our purpose. For us, we should really think about Matthew 24, 14. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the earth as a testimony. And then Jesus will come. Then the end will come. Another, I put down Luke 8, 1, Luke 9, 2, and 3, Luke 10, 11, because after Jesus says what he's, what he's doing, preaching the kingdom, the word of God, and helping people, he sends out the 12. What are they supposed to do? Same thing. Preach the kingdom, help, them, help people. He sends out the 72. Preach the kingdom, help people. But who is he also sending out? Hmm. You and me. In the old days, uh, the Church of God 
pastors, the old timers, they loved Acts 8, 12, and I do too. When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Um, and in Africa, this is, this is a fantastic verse, and I'll tell you why. The Muslims treat women as second-class society. Usually, of course, it was in the Old Testament, too, a very patriarchal society, and old-time America, too, very patriarchal. But look at what this, this is a liberating verse. Remember in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And so when the Muslims come in and try to teach the Quran and Muhammad, uh, we are able to say women are not second class citizens in Christianity. Philip's preaching and they were baptized when they accept the message of the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, and coming again, they were baptized, both men and women. Just a, a beautiful summary of that. Um, some people think Paul doesn't talk about the kingdom of, enough, but I beg to differ. You know, we, uh, we talk about the eight kingdom verses in the book of Acts and so on and so forth. Uh, and remember in Acts 1, what is Jesus doing? And I have this a lot in the paper, so you can look at that. Uh, let me just summarize before I go into Paul's summary. The word occurs 89 times in the New Testament. 42 times it says word of God, but it's also word of the Lord, word of truth, word of grace, word of Jesus, word of the kingdom, word of Isaiah, word of exhortation, word of promise, word of faith. Word of the cross, word of wisdom, word of reconciliation, word of life, word of his power, word of righteousness, word of the oath, word of perseverance, and word of their testimony. So word is a very big thing. But when we start looking uh, at Jesus, remember he says, the word which you hear is not mine. John 14, 24. Uh, Mark 8, 38, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. Uh, verse, uh, Luke 9, 26, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of. Yeah. And of course, in John, John 14, 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine but the fathers who sent me, John 14, 24, and also in John 12, 49. The father has told me what to say and how to say it. Th this is so beautiful, John 12, 49. And then John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done. And, and of course, I should have had another slide here about the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, you know, the seed is mentioned nine times in Matthew. And then you go to Mark 4. As he was sowing some seed, fell by the road uh, eight times. Uh, and, and then in Luke 8, 11, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of the kingdom. I'm sorry, the word of God. So the word of the kingdom is the word of God. The parallel text say that. So we have a euangelion based on the word of God, the good news, the good message, the good things of God. And as Jesus sent the apostles out, we would be sent out. Okay, let's look a little closer at Jesus was a preacher of the kingdom, but also Paul. You know, Luke gives us what he calls an orderly account in this particular section. And yeah, this is the end of the book of Acts, Acts 28. And so he's, he says, he goes to Rome, he's then under house arrest, and he calls all the Jews in, and the Jews are saying, this sect is known to us that everywhere it's spoken against. Well, if you feel people are speaking against you because you're standing up for the unity of God, or the sleep of the dead, or Jesus as the true Messiah, a true human being, you are the one media between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If you think you're being persecuted as a sect, 
Look at what Paul is doing. And he calls the Jews in. And I'll, and I'll read it now from verse 23. Arranging with them a day, they came to him in the lodging where he was, more to whom, and, and Paul was solemnly testifying or t solemnly witnessing. I, I want you to look at that. Dia Martir Romenos. Dear Maturuminus, what was Paul solemnly testifying and witnessing? The same word as martyr there. He's witnessing. What was Paul solemnly witnessing about? The Vasilion to Theu, the kingdom of God. I put it right in the center of the slide. You should be able to pick it out. It's big and bold because it's big and bold in Jesus' mouth. 40 days after his resurrection, went around preaching the kingdom of God. And Paul solemnly witnessing the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. He's like in a gazebo at Melange View Motel and telling these pastors, this is about the kingdom and Jesus. You have a place in the kingdom from morning to night using Moses. Let me remind you of Moses. The seed of the woman, Genesis 3.15, will crush the serpent's head. Genesis 12.3, the descendant of Abraham will bless the whole world. Paul calls that the gospel preached to Abraham. Genesis 49.10, the, the scepter will not depart from Judah. 2 Samuel 7.16, the descendant of David's, will, his house, his kingdom, his throne will be established forever. Micah 5.2, out of you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, comes the one who is to rule over Israel. So it's all there. And in the prophets, Paul's final Caruso. Caruso is uh, the main word for preaching. You have euangelizo, I tell the good news, or Caruso, I cry out as a herald for God. And so this is the last thing we hear from Paul. What does Luke have him doing? He remained two whole years in his hired apartment. He was under house arrest, probably had a Roman chain to him or a ball and chain, something like that, but he's under house arrest. But for two whole years, he welcomed all that were coming to him. What was he doing? Caruson, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the thing concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and unhindered. That to me. So can you imagine? You talk about Martin Luther King in the Birmingham jail. He wrote some letters. What is Paul doing for two years in possibly the finality of his life? He's proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things. Periton Kirian Yesu Christu concerning Jesus with all boldness. Uh, this is just, this should be our marching. <laughs> These should be our marching orders if you have any. But look, this is a picture of the little restaurant in the Melange View Motel. I want you to look carefully at that. The old man in the brown right in the middle standing, brown shirt, that's Pastor Fabiano Bango. The young one sitting down is the Neva Sandy. And the, the one just behind him is Taliana Chaco. And there's Brother Rufus Myers in the black in the blue in the back as well. It, it can't distinguish them from the, these are the leaders of the Mozambique people where there are hundreds of our churches. How did they get to be hundreds of churches? Because we kept feeding them the word of God, the word of the kingdom, the word of the Messiah. Hallelujah. And that's my son, by the way, Jeremy right there. And on the right, you can barely see Rebecca. And my little bald head is behind Jeremy's bald head. But look what's on the table, folks. There's about $1,000 worth of Bibles. What we're doing, we're stamping all the Bibles, and we have tracts and booklets. And, and, the, and the Mozambique pastors, they say Mozambique there, the Mozambique pastors are taking these to their congregations just across the river, 10 miles away at the Mozambique border. So what should we be doing? Getting the word out. And that means the Bible itself, but inside the Bible are the critical ingredients to the euangelion, 
the kingdom of God and the things concerning Jesus. So I, I just love that picture. By the way, the restaurant is back behind those doors behind Rufus. But this is a major effort and we need to continue this to the ends of the earth. And that means next door also. You need to be talking to your next door neighbor about the things that are going on. Who will you talk to? Go from Jerusalem, where you are, to Judea, the surrounding area. From, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, to those people that don't talk exactly like you, that don't look exactly like you. But we are supposed to talk to them about the kingdom of God and Jesus and the salvation and encouraging them to come into faith. Who will you talk to? Isn't this a beautiful setting with the, this is, remember, right off the mountain, Mount Melanji, and you have these gazebos, and we would sit there for hours and talk. So the big gospel is the kingdom gospel. And Paul says this was the gospel that was preached to Abraham, Genesis 12, 3c. In you, all the families of the earth, Haaretz, will be blessed. Baruch, how will they be blessed? By the message of what God is providing. So that descendant of Abraham, Matthew 1, 1. The descendant of David, the descendant of Abraham, the son of David, son of Abraham. That's descendant of Abraham, who is the true Messiah. The true king of the kingdom has been anointed by God as his baptism, waiting as a prince to come back from heaven. And all the families of the earth are going to be blessed by him. Of course, uh, Paul says in Galatians 3.8, Scripture told the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So, folks, we have our job cut out for us. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. We speak the true Messiah, one like Moses, an Israelite, like his brothers with flesh and blood, just like us. What did Jesus say? You seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Is it, does it get any clearer that? Jesus was speaking the, the truth of God, the word of God, the, the message of God, which he heard from God to bring salvation to us. And we're supposed to take, uh, what is it? Second Timothy 2 through and trust to reliable people also this word. What did Jesus say was the most important thing to believe? What is the most important commandment? Well, the most important is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Put God first. Put his message right up there. Oh, this is this is a kind of a closing out picture this is a picture of a pastor who had broken his foot in his youth this is a pastor in balaka malawi and his right foot was broken if you'll notice he's walking on the bottom of the right side of his foot because his ankle evidently had been broken and i've seen that pastor three times at uh, pastor fraser nylea's church how beautiful are the feet of those who bring this good news, the good news of the true God and the true Messiah and the true kingdom. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Joe. For that uh, recording, again, we had to do some of the pre-recordings, uh, presentations recorded, I mean, due to the uh, postponement of the conference. Apologies for that. That's uh, Joe's book you can purchase through Amazon. And here's uh, Joe's email. And by the way, I think Joe is on the chat. So thanks, Joe, for tuning in. Uh, I think there's a question there about how to uh, help in that ministry of Africa, so I'm sure you can take care of that. So thanks once again to Joe Martin for his work. 
in this presentation. All right, so let's see. If we go back to our schedule, we have some time before we break for lunch. Again, this is the theolo the where are we theological conference dot org website. So we have a couple of faith stories before we break for lunch. Um, I'd like to show you again. These are pre-recorded, not only be due to the postponement, but also due to the time. So these are from uh, two international people. One from uh, Denmark and the other from Australia. So I'll play for you first. Uh, Jakob. Jakob is from Denmark, and I hope you enjoy his faith story. Hello, my name is Jakob. I'm from Denmark, 45 years old, and I'm here to share my faith story with you guys through Restoration Fellowship whom I love and owe a great, great deal of things to, uh, because they have really helped me and supported me through these last couple of years. I was brought up in the apostolic church here in Denmark, parents believing in God, attending this apostolic church. They left when I was very little, before I was baptized, actually, they left the Anglican church, that is the, the state church here in Denmark, uh, to go to uh, the apostolic church and it was mainly a matter over uh, infant baptism that that made them make uh, make that decision so uh, so i wasn't baptized as a small child which is kind of rare for for people here in denmark even for unbelievers here in denmark people tend to for traditional reasons uh, baptize their children uh, when they name them here so so that's where i come from as a uh, as a child i was raised in the apostolic church it came with all the the the, the doctrines that that we uh, know from the, the, the charismatic church uh, which i believe uh, the apostolic church is a part of and uh, so i was taught the doctrine of the trinity i was taught the doctrine of eternal conscious torment i was taught the doctrine of going to heaven when we die and all these things were actually things that I, as a child, really spent a lot of time thinking about. It's especially this this part of uh, eternal conscious torment was something that I think for many children, many people uh, trying to come to terms with. And I remember quite a handful of times crying myself to sleep in fear over this fate if I had done something wrong. And this was now my prospect. Uh, this was to be tormented forever it, it was looking back at it it was m mental torture i think for for a child to grow up and in, in being taught this doctrine uh, especially but i also remember that quite often also i was scared about the prospect of floating away to heaven forever like uh, as a disembodied entity of some sort that was a very scary thing for me to try to grasp as well. And it actually also made me cry myself to sleep because I, I didn't understand it, I couldn't grasp it. There were a lot of things I, I was struggling with, e even though uh, I would say that we we as a family was pretty normal for a Christian family in, in Denmark, going to church every Sunday. So it wasn't really something, you know, that I spent a lot of time the, the rest of the week. It was just, you know, it was attending church or Sunday school or whatever it was every Sunday. And But whenever I was in, at church, I, I think I spent a lot of time contemplating the things that I was taught there. And I especially remember one time asking about the Trinity or asking how, I'm not sure, something about how, how could Jesus die if he was God or something like that. And I was maybe 10, 11, 12, something like that. And I was told by their teacher, Sunday school teacher or whatever it was, I was told that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't fit, we couldn't understand God, basically, that's what she said. We couldn't fit him into to whatever small box we wanted him to fit into. So I just had to realize that I would never be able to understand that. And I think that's a pretty standard answer, actually, still for even to grown up people in the church today, they, they will be told that we we can understand who God is and what God is. And of course, we don't understand in, in that sense necessarily all about who and what God is. But I don't think that that when when a passage like John 17, 3 says that we, we need to know who God is and 
the Father, the only true God is, and we know, need to know who Jesus is, then it's a basic teaching that shouldn't be as confusing as I believe that the Trinity doctrine. I, I grew up in my late teens, I, I sort of left the church. I, I was in some some Christian rock bands uh, and so that was my main connection to the church in my late teens. Uh, I didn't necessarily go to church every Sundays, but but I, I went to this Christian, played in, in different churches in, in this rock band that, that I was in. But as I got into my early 20s, I, I got married to a person uh, who isn't a Christian. And so I think I just slowly left the the church activities and I didn't spend anything any time really thinking about these matters at all and and suddenly at some point this became you know like just daily life and I I, I don't think I would um, necessarily call myself a Christian at that time because it was not something that I spent a lot of time thinking about or practicing practicing in, in any way so that was kind of me drifting away. Then actually just a couple of years later, I, I got divorced and I got remarried. And I have now two almost grown up children uh, from, from that marriage. And then I think at, at some point there were things in my, in my early marriage that I felt that were escalating and, and going off track in a direction that I didn't really want to, uh, and, and that I knew was really bad. So at some point decided that I would start seeking God again. And I started seeking the God that I had learned about when I was a child. So so it was with the mindset that that Jesus was God Almighty and it didn't matter if I prayed to him or to the Father because it was all the same thing. And the threat or the prospect of going to hell was also one of the motivators that really shook me at, at, at that time because I, had, I felt that my life had gone so off track that I needed to do something very drastic which I did. Um, I started studying the Bible. I started praying uh, a lot, of course, uh, and I started, you know, to, to pray to God that no matter what, just show me who you are. Show me who we are. Show me what we are doing. Show me what life is, what life is about, because I, I must accept the premise that there is a meaning with all of this, because if there's no, like what Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, if there's no resurrection, then, then all of this is pointless. We would still be in our sins and, and there, is, there is no hope. I could not at that time and still today cannot accept that premise that there is no meaning and that there is no hope. We are far too complex creatures and beings to just be alive for a split second than to die and, and go into oblivion. I do not accept that premise at all. And, and I don't think that, that anyone needs to accept that premise. I started seeking God and started praying for him to give me wisdom, like Solomon prayed, you know, let me let me have wisdom and understanding to, to know and understand what, what, what life is about, I think. I remember specifically uh, coming in contact with an, uh, an ex-Jehovah's Witness who had a website where he had uh, made different articles uh, uh, on different different topics and and specifically the 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 articles he had he he wrote on the doctrine of the trinity was caught my attention and caught my eye very quickly and so i i read that and i read you know like whatever literature he was referencing and and similar views. And that was the first, you know, like, what do you call it, chink in the armor, uh, uh, where this Trinity concept started falling apart for me. And it sort of took Jesus out of this Trinity and placing him somewhere. I, I just had to put him, you know, like up here because I, I, I couldn't make up my mind about the nature of who or what Jesus was or is. He certainly wasn't God the Almighty, which I, came to understand from from those articles which i'm very glad for and, and appreciate uh, that 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 he showed me this having made the first dent in into the trinity doctrine i searched the internet uh, for whatever articles and literature i could find on the topic at one point this is back in 2018 i came across a video with a guy called sid hatch who explained his reasons for not believing the trinity and his conclusions, or one of the conclusions, of course, was that Jesus is a human being, which really spoke to me. And it, and I've heard this from other people as well, and it was certainly true for me. 
it opened up the Bible in a totally new way that that the New Testament came to life in a very different way and in a more real way for me. And it showed me, you know, that I, I as a human being, I'm not detached from the world, from, from what's going on in the heavenly realms, uh, what's going on. I'm actually a part of it, a part of the human race. And I found out and understood that we are actually created to live forever. And we have this prospect and Jesus was a human being and he was the first human being to die and to be raised up from the grave again, which really, really amazed me to think about that. I haven't really, I, I, at that point, I didn't really think about this before, but the New Testament, uh, the, the gospel records are telling us about people who socialized, knew this person, Jesus Christ, a human being, and they saw him, they, they saw him get killed. And then they met him afterwards. I can't even grasp the, the consequences. If, if I had that experience, if, if I lived back then or, or this was going on today, that I saw a human being, being being raised, a guy that I knew to be dead, that testimony, that it just became so much more real that human beings, we are where we are right now because God wants us to, to learn and understand how to live forever. He wants us to be trained and to choose his will over our own will. Then we can have the same hope that, that we saw in Jesus. We saw a human being come to life. And that's just, for me, that was totally mind-blowing. It, it still is, even these years later, it still is totally mind-blowing that a human being was raised from, from death. So, so, so that really spoke to me. Uh, so specifically, being able to, to take down Jesus from that shelf and putting him into the category of human beings was just really something very powerful. And um, so this, I, I shared my faith story back in 2019. So that's three years ago now. Of course, things have changed and happened uh, in, in those three years that has passed since then. I remember specifically speaking about how I had to kind of keep reminding myself that the coming kingdom was a physical reality because of course, as a child, I'd al al always learned that we were going to heaven. So whatever happened afterwards, it was something spiritual, non-physical, but learning that the coming kingdom is a physical kingdom. It, it, it's, it's like earth is now just more amazing with more life, with no sin, with no greed, with no lust, with no violence, with no, all these things that are destroying us, uh, making us incapable of living forever right now. Back then, I, I would have said, you know, okay, now I understand how real this faith, how real God is, how real everything is, you know, it's going on around us. But now three years later, it has become even more real. I, I don't know if, if if other people have like same the same experience, but as a child, my faith was something, things about God was something that was going on in like a different dimension, um, very separated from my daily life. Three years ago, I, I would have said that Oh, now I see how real it is. But now here, three years later, it has become even more real. And I'm absolutely certain and I hope with all my heart that it will be three years from now, even more real because uh, it is real. It is what life is all about right now. It's to turn back to God and start training ourselves to do his will and being disciplined and, and trained as, as children, as we read so many places in the Bible. So uh, e even though I might not, not have changed views on the major doctrines i don't think i really have since then but I, I would say that that just continually studying the bible reading it every day give a more nuanced picture of of, of what's going on which i really appreciate of course and specifically for me the, these days or this past uh, maybe six months i have looked very much into the pattern of how the jews were led through the desert had to put god com god's commandments his will on their hearts and start learning to living according to them because that's what that's how they would have to live in the land that they were, were going to uh, and, and this image of being disciplined by god through learning and understanding his will what is right to do what is what is just to do and start teaching ourselves and training ourselves to do it and live it every day that image in, in the old testament has become very vivid to me 
like um, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 6 or Deuteronomy 8, where it says that God is testing, God was testing the Jews when they walked in the desert. He told them to put his commands in their hearts because this is how they were going to live in the, the, the land that they were going to take. And he did that to test them and to see if they wanted to obey his commandments and to reveal to them and to him what lived inside human beings. And, and that's what I think the, the, the Bible does today very much, or should do anyway, convict ourselves of what we're doing wrong now. God has most certainly re revealed to me what, what lives inside me. Uh, and that's that's not pleasant, and, and it shouldn't be pleasant, and and it should be a course for the image in the Bible about being a child, being ready to be disciplined. Very strong image for me, I think. Just the value of studying the Old Testament to see the patterns that God is talking about and showing us in the Old Testament is just something just recently has been my main focus or interest, I think. So my conclusion and my last words here would be that our attitude should be being children that are being disciplined, trained to to live in this coming kingdom, as we hear and read uh, referenced in the New Testament, that the coming kingdom where Jesus will come back and restore this world and, and teach people and, and, and make the world righteous, that disciplining is a very good thing, even though it hurts, even though it's difficult, and even though it, it, it should rip us apart sometimes, because God needs to show us what lives inside us. So that disciplining of our mindset or of our thinking is something that, that I think we should really cherish. We are the creation, and the Creator has set these rules up for us to, to show us these boundaries so we can be taught how to, to live forever. Thank God we don't live forever right now because we know what lives in our hearts. So we need to get rid of that and be reschooled to his will. Thank you, Jakob. By the way, Jakob's in the chat right now. He is able to chat with you. And this is Jakob's email. So if you'd like to contact him and uh, give him your support uh, out there in Denmark, a very limited fellowship, as you can appreciate, as most of us around the world are in this type of like-mindedness. So I hope you can show your support to Jacob, and um, we appreciate his time and the time he gave here for his uh, faith story. So that's his email once again. Please uh, write it down, JFKCPH. And... Um, Uh, let's see, let's just looking through the chat here. Uh, Michelle says, hello, Jacob, we continue to pray for you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, uh, we met Jacob uh, some years ago at, at the conference when we used to have it live in person. So good to see him on here. All right, we move along here, as you can see the schedule. So we're doing faith stories, starting a bit early, supposed to start at 12. We have one more faith story before we break for lunch. And again, this is recorded because uh, this is actually from Australia. So let's see the next uh, faith story here. So this is Jenny from Australia, and I hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Jenny Michelson. I live in Melbourne, Victoria, um, Australia. Uh, as you may know, Melbourne uh, takes the, uh, the record for being the most locked down city in the world. So we're quite famous this um, past couple of years. So um, yeah, I'm married to Greg. Uh, my husband, Greg, we've been married since um, Oh, I'm too old to remember how long, since 1994, however many years that is, 20 something. And uh, we have four children. Um, the eldest is 21, the youngest is 14. Uh, two girls and two boys. Our girls were actually um, adopted from India when they were babies and uh, our boys are both children. So I work full time at um, a Christian school, Nunawading Christian College as the school bursar. Um, I do the accounts and that sort of thing. 
Yeah, so I grew up in what is called the Uniting Church, um, which is um, in Australia. Um, many years ago in the 1970s, the Presbyterian, Methodist and Congregational Churches, um, many, many of the churches merged into one church and they called it the Uniting Church. Uh, so my parents and my two siblings um, brought me up in that church. And uh, when I was about 13, uh, my parents decided that um, they would no longer attend church, um, but I decided that I would continue, most likely because um, I had friends there and uh, it wasn't really because of any um, conviction that I had, although I did believe in God. Uh, but yeah, I, I just kept going. I, I don't really know why, looking back, um, maybe God's hand was in it. And yeah, anyway, so throughout my teenage years, I would take myself off to this Uniting Church. Um, and then after I finished high school, uh, some of the um, young people who were a year ahead of me had uh, gone off to university and become part of a group called Students for Christ. And they came uh, back to our little youth group at our church and started saying to the rest of us, um, hey, there's a bit more to Christianity than what we're being taught at church. Um, I probably should mention that Uniting Church is quite a liberal church in Australia. Uh, we used to joke that um, we would go to church and learn about basket weaving in Fiji, um, but that's not too far off the truth. Uh, so we didn't really have any understanding of the gospel or salvation or anything like that. So uh, when our friends came back from university, um, having joined this group called Students for Christ, um, they started to challenge us, the rest of us who were there. We were a small group, um, uh, a very small group of young people, but um, yeah, we started to feel uncomfortable. And uh, the in the coming year, I also went to university and a couple of these young people were at the same university as I was at Melbourne University. And um, they and a few of the people in Students for Christ started to, um, shall I say, pursue me. <laughs> um, they would try and meet up with me to talk to me about Christianity and um, I did my best to avoid them because as far as I was concerned, I was already a Christian. Um, and this, this group, Students for Christ, was actually a Pentecostal group and that was the first time I'd come across any, anything like that at all and it sort of uh, freaked me out a little bit. Um, but they kept pursuing me and wanting to meet with me and tell me about God and salvation, etc, etc. And um, so eventually I um, realised that um, throughout all my youth I um, had had no understanding whatsoever of the gospel um, and salvation, anything. I, I really only knew a few bits and pieces. And I became convicted that um, I truly was a sinner and I needed to repent of my sins. And yeah, that was the start of um, a major turnaround for me. Uh, throughout uni, we kept going to um, this group, Students for Christ. Uh, I never felt totally comfortable with the whole Pentecostal scene. Um, there was lots of speaking in tongues and, um, you know, endless uh, singing of the same song over and over and over again, which, um, yeah, was a bit out of my comfort zone. But it certainly did give me the conviction that um, I wasn't committed to um, to God before and that I needed to have a radical life change and it, it had serious implications um, for me in a way because um, I became convicted that I wanted to be baptized full immersion um, water baptized and uh, in the Uniting Church um, I had been as we could say sprinkled as a child as a baby um, so the Uniting Church wasn't willing to baptize me and um, when I broached this with um, the lovely young minister there, um, I was actually quite shocked that he said that if I wanted to get baptised, it would be like uh, 
putting a sword through the church, um, the people who had supported me while I was growing up. So I was quite, um, I guess, shocked at this. And it also made me rethink where I wanted to go to church. So I ended up starting to go to a Pentecostal church. Um, <clears throat> before that, I, I found um, through a friend, a Baptist church who was willing, uh, the pastor was willing to baptize me. So uh, I got baptized and um, yeah, that was, I guess, the beginnings of my journey with Christianity. And things then started to change throughout my, my 20s. Yes, yeah, so throughout my 20s, um, I should just mention also at this youth group at the Uniting Church, um, that's where I met Greg, who was to um, become my husband. Uh, he had turned up at this church out of the blue, not having been brought up in a Christian family. Um, he read a, a small, uh, I think it was a little prayer book. And um, through reading this little prayer book, he decided um, as an 18 year old, he would take him off, his, himself off to church. So he just um, landed in the local church, which was where I happened to have been brought up in. So um, yeah, throughout um, in my 20s, um, I, my early 20s, I was mostly going to a Pentecostal church. Again, feeling uncomfortable about certain things, but I do give them a lot of credit that um, they were very committed. Um, I did a Bible course through them. I, I just learned so much more about the Bible, which I, which was just a revelation to me because I'd never read the Bible in my life. <laughs> only um, had only heard bits and pieces from the Uniting Church. So um, Greg, my husband, or he wasn't my husband then, um, he started to go to what was called the Worldwide Church of God. Um, some of you may know that, um, particularly if you're in America, because it came from America, basically, um, Herbert Armstrong's church. And he was convicted that that was the one true church. Now, um, I wasn't convicted of that. And um, so continued to go to uh, the uh, Pentecostal church. Um, but I was concerned um, that, yeah, uh, because, the Worldwide Church of God was saying that it was the one true church. Um, I didn't believe that. And I um, obviously had a vested interest um, in um, hoping that Greg would come out of that. So um, I ended up trying to contact people around the world to see if anybody had been in the Worldwide Church of God and had um, come out of it because um, Greg felt that if he could speak to somebody who'd already been a Worldwide Church of God person um, and who understood the issues that he was going through, that um, that would help him to see whether he still believed, whether they uh, were indeed the One True Church. And um, through my letters that went to various places around the world, this is pre-email, of course, um, so we had to do everything the slow way. <laughs> um, I was contacted by a person in Western Australia who said, oh, in Melbourne, um, there's a guy there who has been in the Worldwide Church of God and has come out. So um, I contacted this person and eventually uh, Greg and I went to meet him and um, he was able to show Greg um, a few things from the Bible, to, which was enough to convince Greg that that wasn't the, word, the one true church. And um, so after that, we became part of um, uh, this guy's church. It was called the Melbourne Church of God. It was basically just a, a smallish, um, more or less independent type of church in Melbourne. And uh, and Greg and I then uh, got married in our late 20s and were attending this church. So since then, <laughs> um, for many, many years, um, even though um, the church, the Melbourne Church of God, uh, was not a Trinitarian church and um, and taught me a lot against the Trinity um, because the Uniting Church had that I grew up in had believed in the Trinity and was firmly Trinitarian being a traditional church. Um, the Melbourne Church of God people were able to show me uh, God's not a Trinity and this was quite a revelation to me um, and it helped me to start to see things in a different light and it started to make the Bible make a lot more sense to me. However, 
we did believe that um, Jesus pre-existed and, um, and that is a belief that I held for many, many, many years. In fact, I'd say up until the last two to three years. Um, after our, our minister from the, uh, the Melbourne Church of God um, passed away a few years ago, uh, Greg, my husband, started to um, investigate a bit more uh, what we were believing about Jesus and the nature of God. And he started listening to a lot of um, uh, Brother Kel's uh, videos on YouTube uh, from the Trinity Delusion. And um, I can say that every time I would um, come up to our bedroom after work, there would be my husband lying on the bed with the headphones on <laughs> listening to Brother Kel. Um, so over, I guess, he'd be able to tell you better, but maybe a year or so of listening to Brother Kel and he started to investigating, investigate other um, speakers as well, um, Anthony being one of them, Anthony Buzzard, um, Greg became quite convicted that Jesus did not pre-exist and that we had been in error on this issue for many, many years, over 20 years. Um, I give my husband great credit because he decided that because we'd been in error in this, we could be in error on other things. And so uh, he invested, investigated everything. He looked into oneness theology um, and yeah, different variations until he was fully convinced that um, biblical Unitarianism was, um, yeah, the truth, the best way of interpreting the Bible. So uh, this again was a bit of a challenge to me and um, Greg challenged me to start to look into it more for myself. Um, being a busy mum who works at a very full-on full-time job and having four children, um, it was a um, bit more difficult for me to find the time to sit and listen to things and read things. But um, yeah, through Greg's challenging, I started to do this and bit by bit, um, I started to see that, yeah, um, I believe this too. I think we have been wrong all these years. And um, again, with the revelation I'd had earlier from um, moving from the Pentecostal scene into the Melbourne Church of God and realizing that God wasn't a trinity, um, this further understanding of who God was um, just came as um, just something amazing to me. I could see even more how scriptures fit in, um, you know, in perfect harmony when you looked at the at the Bible this way. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to um, understand more of who the true God um, of the Bible, the true God of us is. And so since then, um, I've continued to study. Um, I'm the sort of person who needs to be taught. Um, I don't see things necessarily by reading and studying the Bible for myself. I actually need people to uh, lead me and um, discuss things with me and um, help me to be able to see to see things. So uh, yeah, over the last couple of years, I've um, been reading Anthony Buzzard's books, um, also uh, Greg Dybul's book was very useful to me, um, various other books, and of course, still listening to Trinity Delusion and other videos like that as well. So I wouldn't say that I could um, stand up in front of you now and give a um, full explanation of why I believe all these things. I'm still on that journey of learning and understanding and um, being able to defend what I believe. Um, but I'm hoping that bit by bit I will get there. I would have to say I would rather my 18 year old son Joel was speaking to you than me because at 18 he has also been really studying these things and um, yeah, amazes me that he can articulate why he believes what he believes much better than his, uh, his old mother. <laughs> so maybe one day um, he might have the opportunity to uh, share his journey with you as well.
and for anybody who's listening to this, um, one piece of advice that uh, Greg, my husband, and I have learned over the years is that um, we never have everything right. There's no person, there's no church um, that has it all together. And when we can realize this and hopefully learn to be humble and learn to be teachable, learn to be willing to change, I believe that's when God can really work in our lives. When we get stuck on the one path and um, we just are heading in the one direction and nothing anybody says to us will change our mind, I think that's quite dangerous. We need to be open to always um, learning the truth and being willing to repent and change our minds when we're wrong. So if, if you've already come to a similar understanding on God um, as we have, um, I guess the biblical Unitarian or the position, though I just prefer to call myself a Christian, um, then yeah, look, I'd encourage you to continue. Um, it, it is a bit of a tough road. It's, it's difficult to find um, other believers um, to fellowship with. It is a small group, but um, the truth is worth it. So I'd encourage you to, um, uh, to hang in there and to continue to seek God. If you haven't um, ever come across this position before where um, God the Father is the one true God and um, Jesus is the Lord Jesus Christ, um, not a pre-existent God the Son, then I'd encourage you just to um, challenge yourself. Um, just think about that uh, perhaps I might be wrong, perhaps my understanding might be wrong. And, and to investigate further, there are many, many, many resources um, that we have available to us on the internet now. And um, even if you, know, you don't live near anybody who has a similar belief, it doesn't necessarily matter. You can find what you need by using resources um, that others have made available. Of course, the biggest resource is the Bible <laughs> and that is our source of truth. So we want everything that we believe to line up with what God is teaching us through his word. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. That was Jenny from Australia. Thank you, Jenny. And um, let's see, okay, we will wrap up this afternoon. This is day two, Theological Conference 2022. We'll be back. As you can see there from the schedule at 2 p.m. These are Eastern Standard Times, by the way, New York Times. So we're back with Ken Laprade at 2 p.m. And he'll be joining us, I believe and hope, live from Texas. So hope that there are no technical issues. We should be able to get Ken live. And then we'll follow that with Michael Schrempf from uh, Germany. Okay, once again, let me remind you of the free book giveaway tonight. If you'd like to be part of this draw for any of the books, and I'll show you. If you go to the homepage of Restoration Fellowship, click on links, go to books. So if you'd like to take part in this free giveaway, uh, for one of the books we have published, there's uh, the latest, One God, the Father, One Man, Messiah, Translation, Commentary from Anthony. So you can pick any of these books. And we also have Keegan's book. We have reprinted, uh, ordered a reprint of this book. So Keegan's book, much sought after, as uh, a lot of people ask us about it. So for your chance to win, email me. There's the email, carlos at thehumanjesus.org. Again, the draw or the book giveaway will be tonight. I'll pick from the names, depending how many people we get. And uh, we will do that at 7 p.m. again, Eastern Standard Time. So get your name before, let's say, 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, again, New York time, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, email me your name and I'll put you in the giveaway. Again, free 
giveaway of the book. All right, so we shall return soon. So hope you can come back after the lunch break with Ken Laprade.